Hello my friends. Welcome to my channel, Lindy's Magpie Reads. If you're new here, I'm Lindy. I don't usually do a monthly wrap up, but since my last video, the Friday Reads, I finished four more books and in April I just had so much fun with booktube readathons that I thought I would mention my overall experience with those. Plus, I've had three Biblio adventures since Friday, <laughs> so I want to tell you about those. Starting with a performance of Nevermore. This is a musical about the life of Edgar Allan Poe. The full title is Nevermore, The Imaginary Life and Mysterious Death of Edgar Allan Poe. Uh, this was a concert performance, so it wasn't the full costume musical, which was created by a local theatre company, Catalyst Theatre, and went to Broadway, nominated for a bunch of awards. Just the music took two and a half hours. It was fantastic. I really loved it. If you have a chance to see this performance or um, purchase the music online, the soundtrack, the performance here was done by the original cast and I've been a Catalyst Theatre fan for a long time so that was really great to see too. And that was on Saturday. Uh, earlier in the day on Saturday I went to two different independent bookstores to celebrate Independent Bookstore Day. I will tell you more about those adventures at the end of this video. Sunday I saw a performance of Sexual Misconduct of the Middle Classes, a play written by Hannah Moscovich and oh, the play itself won a Governor General's Award for English Language Drama in about 2021 I think. Loved it, just loved it. Finished four books and the first one I'm going to tell you about is Margaret Atwood's collection of short stories, Old Babes in the Woods. Isn't this a fantastic cover design? Uh, Suzanne Dean is the cover designer. She also did this edition of Murakami's The Strange Library. Love her work. Atwood? I had doubts about Atwood. Hmm. I think it was four or five years ago that I saw her on stage at the Vancouver Writers Festival with Andrew O'Hagan and some of the things that she said about the Me Too movement not only shocked me but also Andrew O'Hagan. Uh, you could see that he was taken aback. Well, I certainly felt it too. So I wasn't sure if I was going to go off Margaret Atwood or not. I'm really glad that I picked up these stories. They are mostly from the viewpoint of a woman in her 80s, as is Atwood, and that uh, dark wit and wisdom really comes through. Except for one story that I didn't care for, which was framed as a conversation between Margaret Atwood and the dead George Orwell, I liked all the rest of these and many of them I loved. Uh, she does that thing in some of these which you usually find in a poem where there's a turn near the end. So I'm not talking about a twist, but how a story is going along, usually in a humorous sort of tone, a bit of nostalgia, and then suddenly it's a knife to the heart. And that happened enough times and I was just weeping, crying. I had to take a break 
before I could go on to another story or read anything else. Yeah, lots of emotional impact in these stories. Many of them are about uh, widows and looking back on uh, tough times like the war, World War II. Whoa. I'm going to read you a little bit to give you a flavor. This is from the title story, Old Babes in the Wood. It's too hot to have the wood stove on, so they heat the water on the ancient two-burner propane cylinder camping stove. It's rusting out around the intake pipe, but so far there have been no explosions. New propane stove is on the list. The kettle is aluminum of a type that has surely been outlawed. Just looking at it gives Nell cancer, but an unspoken rule says that it must never be discarded. The cover will fit only if placed just right. Nell marked the position years ago with two circles of pink nail polish, one on the lid, a corresponding one on the kettle itself, which must be stored upside down so that mice won't make their way down the spout and starve to death and make a horrible smell, plus maggots. Learn by doing, Nell thinks. There have been enough dead mice and maggots in her life. The tea in the lidded 1940s enameled roasting pan labeled tea is practically sawdust. They keep meaning to throw it out. Lizzie has come prepared with her own tea bags in a plastic Ziploc. Bags are easier to discard than soggy tea leaves, even though everyone knows that tea bags are made from floor sweepings and mud. In the days of Tig, he and Nell had always used loose leaf, which he bought at a little specialty shop run by a knowledgeable woman from India. Tig would have derided the tea bags. The days of Tig. Over now. High up on the wall, above the wood stove, hangs the flat, oblong griddle that Nell and Tig bought at a farm auction 40-odd years ago, and on which jovial sourdough pancake fryings often took place, Tig doing the flipping back when largesse and riotous living and growing children had been the order of the day. Coming up, who's next? She can't look directly at this griddle. She glances up at it, then glances away. But she always knows it's there. My heart is broken, Nell thinks. But in our family, we don't say, my heart is broken. We say, are there any cookies? One must eat, one must keep busy, one must distract oneself. But why? What for? For whom? Are there any cookies? She manages to croak out. No, Lizzie says, but there's chocolate. Let's have some. She knows that Nell's heart is broken. She doesn't need to be told. It's old babes in the wood. Next up is another Canadian author, Zoe Whithall, with her new novel, The Fake. There are three central characters in here. Zoe Whittall is queer. She always has queer content in her books. And the three central characters in here, uh, one of them, Shelby, is a lesbian, a widow. And she also has high anxiety. And she's a hypochondriac and she is grieving the recent death of her wife, Kate. I'm gonna read you just a little bit. I don't know what's wrong with her, Shelby heard her mother say to her father on the phone. Why can't she get over the fact that her friend died? Kate wasn't her friend, she was her wife, her partner of six years. Her mother still can't say girlfriend, let alone wife. Shelby told her to get out not to come back. She didn't need her. She wouldn't understand. But then she came back around with groceries and they acted like it didn't happen. And it was better than having no one in the room with her sometimes, breathing the same air, relating to her as a fellow alive person. Well, Shelby 
eventually manages to get herself off the couch and go to a grief peer support group. She gets herself out of the house and starts regretting right away, wishes that she was back on her couch, but she says, longing to be on the couch feels better than being on the couch. So she's doing something for herself. But at the grief session, she meets this other person who is a fake, a big fat liar, a sociopath, and suffers the effects. So it is a page turner. It's a, a serious look at um, trusting strangers and is it human nature to trust? And if we're burned, how do we trust again? You know, that kind of thing. So, yeah, I quite enjoyed this. I do recommend it. Next up is an audiobook, a memoir. I just finished it this morning, so I'm not going to count it for People April. We'll get back to People April readathon towards the end of this video. The book is called Empress of the Nile. The daredevil archaeologist who saved Egypt's ancient temples from destruction. It's by Lynn Olson, who's an American historian and journalist. And the audiobook is read by Lisa Flanagan. It's about 13 hours long. It's very thorough. And the person this biography is about I'd never heard of before. She sounds totally amazing. A French woman named Christiane de Rocher Noblecourt. She was an Egyptologist who had some daring adventures during World War II, saving the um, precious art in the Louvre, and that's documented in this book. And then also later on in life, she played a crucial role in saving a whole bunch of temples that were going to be buried underwater when the Aswan High Dam was built. So this was in the early 60s. This was actually an amazing engineering feat, but even before, any of that could happen, they had to get a lot of money, which required a lot of countries working together, which required a lot of diplomacy because this was uh, when there were, well, more than tensions between Egypt and Israel and Britain and France. <laughs> the Suez Canal crisis, uh, you know, lots of stuff happening. And I learned that de Rocher Noblecourt played an important role, and, and so did Jacqueline Kennedy, actually. So it was a fascinating, fascinating biography and history and got me going down all these internet rabbit holes looking at these ancient Egypt artifacts. The last time that I was in New York City, I went to the Met and I remember seeing the Dender Temple there. Uh, now I know the whole story behind how it came to be there in the museum in New York City. And I learned many other things too. And the fourth book that I have finished lately is this amazing translation from Swedish, Osebo, uh, Voices from a Swedish Village by Marit Kapla, and it's translated by Peter Graves. I heard about this on Sean the Book Maniac's channel. He had the Irish author Ronan Hessian as a guest. They were just chatting about books, and this is one of the ones that Ronan talked about, and it sounded so good. 
uh, and yeah, it is. It's excellent. My friend Kathy and I buddy read this. We're going to have our final discussion later today. <laughs> Lots of flagged passages to talk about. It's a compilation of multiple voices from this small little Swedish village. The author uh, recorded conversations and then she's laid it on the page in verse format. And the overall effect reminds me of what Daphne Palasi Andredis did in Brown Girls, which I talked about in my last video, where you get a, a sense of multiplicity and community from many, many voices. In this case, it's not in a we, you know, they, each voice is individual, uh, but there's that sense of history. Some of these people that she was talking to were in their 80s and 90s. Some died since she recorded them. And then there are younger people as well. The issues of just how we live our lives and of the migration of people from rural areas or small towns to the cities and how that affects our lives and it reminded me in a way of Max Porter's Lanny and also John McGregor's Reservoir 13. So if, if you've read either of those you can sort of get a, an idea about the feel in here. Whew. I yeah. I don't know what else to say except Ronan, you're right. It's outstanding. <laughs> well now I'm gonna have a little Sand Hill Crane interlude because it's that migration time and we had cranes flying overhead yesterday. And last week, we went out to our friend's property, which is about an hour away from Edmonton, and they border the Paddle River. And I saw bird tracks that were as big as my hand. I thought, these have got to be sandhill cranes or something like that for them to be so large. So, yeah, that, it was great. Anyway, it's... The experience of seeing hundreds of these huge birds and hearing them fly overhead just lifts my heart. It's wonderful. So now I'm going to get into the April readathons and group reads, starting with Trans Girl April, which is hosted by Kevy of Say Kevy and Willow of Books and Bow. They had two group reads, one being Felix Ever After by Kaysen Callender, and I read that in May 2020, so I didn't reread it for the group read. The second one I really wanted to read, and that is Hazel Jane Plant's new book, Any Other City. However, it was supposed to come out on April 18th, the publisher is Arsenal Pulp, and that publisher distributes through a company that was doing inventory when this book came out. And so bookstores, in Edmonton anyway, weren't able to get copies. They were just at the distributor, but nothing was happening at the distributor because inventory. Anyway, 
So I didn't actually get this until Saturday and I am going to read it soon. So I did not participate in the group read for this. I actually didn't see either Kevy or Willow talking about it, so I don't know if they had the same problem getting their hands on it, but it's here now. So I did read 13 books by trans or non-binary authors, and they were Welcome to St. Hell by Lewis Hancock's Disintegrate, Dissociate by Ariel Twist, Revenge of the Raccoons by Vivek Shreya, The Third Person by Emma Grove, Witchy by Ariel Slamet Reese, Grease Bats by Archie Bongiovanni, When We Were Sisters by Fatima Asghar, A Pros and Cons List for Strong Feelings by Will Betke Brunswick, If You're a Kid Like Gavin, The True Story of a Young Trans Activist by Gavin Grimm, which was also counted for picture book readathon and Survivor's Guilt by Robin Geigel and Manhunt by Gretchen Felker Martin for Laika the dog who learned the names of the stars by Kai Cheng Tom and this was also for picture this picture book readathon and finally Galaxy the prettiest star by Jadzia Axelrod. For Picture This 2023, the Picture Book Readathon that was hosted by Shelley of Shelley Swearingen and Jack of Spread Book Joy, I read 14 picture books that I counted in Goodreads. I actually read more than that that I didn't even keep track of. And I did make a special picture book only video. I will link it down below. And of course I will link the channels of these booktubers that I'm telling you about. And then there was People April hosted by Elizabeth of Bouquins and Books and Roz of Scally Dandling About the Books. They encouraged us to read memoir and biography, all oh, non-fiction. I read 10 including Welcome to St. Hell by Lewis Hancock's The Third Person by Emma Grove. As you see, some, sometimes it was double duty. Some of these are by trans uh, writers. Below the Edge of Darkness by Edith Witter, a pros and cons list for strong feelings, again, by Will Betke Brunswick. Thick Skin by Hilary Peach. Ben the Sea Lion, by Roy Henry Vickers, Unraveling, What I Learned About Life While Shearing Sheep, Dying Wool, and Making the World's Ugliest Sweater, by Peggy Orenstein, Listen, How Evelyn Glennie, A Deaf Girl, Changed Percussion, by Shannon Stalker, that one also is picture book format, as well as the picture book I've already mentioned, If You're a Kid Like Gavin, by Gavin Grimm, and the group Read Along was The Five, The Untold Stories of the Women Killed by Jack the Ripper by Hallie Rubenhold. And then just today I read Empress of the Nile, which I just told you about. Well, it would make 11 if I could count that one because I mostly read it during April. I've also been participating in the Book Naturalist Book Club that Heidi of This Reading Life and Doris of Aldi Books have been hosting, but I didn't read the April pick. It's called Call of the Reed Warbler by Charles Massey. Heidi did a great video. I will link it down below. What I did instead, I watched a TED Talk that Charles Massey did about regenerative farming. This is a topic I'm actually very interested in. Uh, as Heidi mentioned in her video, Call of the Reed Warbler is on the academic side. It's rather dry. If you are looking for something more lyrical on the same subject, I highly recommend 
reading something by James Rebank. So this one, English Pastoral, uh, this is the British edition and it has a different name in the US and Canada. And there's a classic, The One Straw Revolution by Fukuoka. Uh, I think it had several translators. That one came out in the 70s. I also highly recommend that one. And at Independent Bookstore Day, I picked up this, Soil. <laughs> the title alone was enough to draw me in. It, the subtitle is The Story of a Black Mother's Garden. It's by Camille Dungy. So, I haven't read it yet. This is part of my Independent Bookstore Day haul. And I don't usually do book hauls, but I thought, Oh, I will quickly show you what I got. I picked up With or Without Angels by Douglas Bruton. I am going to be doing a buddy read with Sean the Book Maniac. You will soon be hearing more about that. The Book of Rain by Thomas Wharton. He's a Canadian author, actually a local author. He lives in Edmonton and it is uh, climate fiction. Another Canadian author, Priya Guns. Your driver is waiting and it is about a woman who's a rideshare driver. This one is described as auto fiction by J.D. Derbyshire, the Mercy Jean. And Derbyshire is non-binary. Another memoir, Carrie, by Tony Jensen. Uh, the subtitle, A Memoir of Survival on Stolen Land. Jensen is Métis, and I think this book features gun violence. I think that's the carry that's being referred to here, but I'm not sure, haven't read it yet. And lastly, this great title, You Are Human and You Need Cake by Julie Van Rosendahl. I saw a big hardcover version of this when I was at Monroe Books in Victoria last month and decided to put my name on the waiting list at the library. There's a hundred people ahead of me. But then at Independent Bookstore Day, I saw they've got, it's, um, it's a paperback slim version, $20. And who doesn't love cake? <laughs> Tomorrow I am leaving for Whitehorse, just going for five days, so I'll be back by Sunday. But I wanted to get a video done of to get caught up with everything that's been happening because there's going to be lots of new stuff with travel, visiting my sister. Thank you so much for watching. I appreciate it. Uh, let me know if you participated in any of these uh, Well, there's Frida. <laughs> Thanks so much for watching, everybody. I'll see you again soon. Bye for now.